Hi, I'm Brian Mackard, and I was raised a fundamentalist Mormon. My dad had four wives and 31 children. I'm a seventh generation Mormon. My family history goes back to the days of Joseph Smith and the Mormon Church. The first Mormon in my family was my fourth great-grandfather, and he was a member of the church's first high council when Joseph Smith introduced polygamy as a revelation from God. He was one of the members of the first high council who actually voted to accept the revelation that we now have as the 132nd section of the Doctrine and Covenants as being a revelation from God, and it was canonized. From that day on, polygamy has been a part of my family, right down to me. I was raised in a polygamous home. Back in 1890, the Mormon Church did away with polygamy with the manifesto signed by Wilford Woodruff. When the Mormon Church did away with polygamy, my family broke away from the Mormon Church. Like many fundamentalists, they believed that the Mormon Church had turned its back on one of the most sacred doctrines of Mormonism. They believed that there was no other path to godhood except through the new and everlasting covenant of marriage, or plural marriage. That those who denied it or refused to live it, live it would be damned, just like Joseph, or Brigham Young said that they would. So they broke away, and I was raised in a very secretive society. In polygamy, uh, there's a lot of rivalry that goes on. The wives daily compete for the resources that they need to be able to raise their children. They compete for their husband's love and affection. They compete for acceptance. The children also compete. They compete for the love and affection of their father and the love and affection of their mother. And many times these rivalries spill over and become feuds between families. Lines are drawn based on who your mother is. And uh, it's a very troubling home to live in where you're constantly in competition with your brother or your sister. Or if you're a woman who's married in polygamy, you're competing against your husband's wives. It's a very harsh environment to live in. My father's home was an abusive home. My father uh, later in life became physically abusive, uh, emotionally abusive. It was very hard growing up and having any time with my father. Uh, in polygamy, your dad does not have any time for you at all. There's no way in the world any man, no matter how hard he tries, can spread himself thin enough to give 31 children the love and affection that they need from their father. And this was one thing that was missing in my life growing up in polygamy. I didn't have a good father figure I had to learn about what it was like to be a man from my brothers. See, I was the 11th of my father's 12 sons. I was one of the youngest. And so I learned how to be a man from my brothers who were trying to learn how to be men themselves. It's not a very good environment for a young man to grow up in. And so what this left me with was a, a yearning and a longing for my father and his acceptance and his love. And I never got that. Because we lived in a secretive society, we were constantly being told how the outside world hated us and wanted to destroy us, that Satan and his, his minions were waiting for us to set foot off of our property where he could then control us and destroy us. It was with fear that we were kept inside the compounds that we lived in. Fear of communication with the outside world, fear of being ridiculed by them or being persecuted by them. A lot of the way things were held together in a polygamous community were held together by a tapestry of fear. If it wasn't the outside world that was trying to destroy you, there were the many condemnations that were being handed down within the community. Uh, if you 
refused to take a woman as a wife, they would strip all your wives from you and, and mark you as a condemned man and excommunicate you from the community. Uh, if you didn't live righteously enough as a wife and submit yourself fully to your husband and his uh, desire to have other women, your very salvation was at stake. And the one thing we did learn how to do was to hide our emotions and hide our feelings and bury them deep down and put on this facade that all was well in Zion when it wasn't. When I was a kid, uh, when I got to the age of seven, my parents began to tell me that I needed to have my own testimony of the Mormon Church, of the Book of Mormon, and of Joseph Smith as a true prophet of God. And so they encouraged me to read the Book of Mormon and to pray that God would give me a burning of the bosom, that I would, I would have this as a confirmation that these things were true. Well, I went away and I, I prayed for about two weeks. And I read and I was fervent in my prayers that God would show me what He had shown all my siblings before me. Everyone I knew was a Mormon. And everyone I knew had received the same burning of the bosom, the same confirmation. And I too felt that if I had just approached God, was honest with Him about my desire to know for myself whether the things, these things were true or not, that He too would give me a burning of the bosom. After two weeks, I didn't receive anything. And I went to my mother in fear. I said, Mom, I've, I, I, I've prayed and I've prayed and I haven't received a burning of the bosom. And she said, well, you haven't prayed fervently enough then, son. Go back and pray again and, and come back and talk to me in about a week and let me know how you feel. My eternity was at stake. My eternal salvation was at stake. And I prayed with all the fervency that I could muster that God would give me a burning of the bosom and reveal to me that these things were true. And it never came. I began to think about Pharaoh. Now, in the Bible it says that God created Pharaoh so that he could show his mighty hand in delivering Israel. Pharaoh was created predestined for his destiny. Was I going to be a son of perdition? Was I predestined to not believe in Mormonism? Is this why I didn't receive a burning of the bosom? And I went to my mother in fear of just crying my eyes out in fear that I had been predestined to not receive a testimony because one was not coming. My mother said, son, tell me what you feel when you pray. And I explained to her all the symptoms of anxiety, the anxiety that I was going through, the fear. And she said, son, you've already received your burning of the bosom. That is the burning of the bosom. You just don't know what to call it. And rather than say, well, wait a minute, mom, that can't be right. I decided to accept it and hope that she was right. After all, all my other siblings who'd gone before me had received this same burning into the bosom. She certainly must know what she's talking about. And so rather than question it, I chose to accept it. But from that day on, I always wondered about Mormonism. I never knew for myself that it was true because I never received a burning of the bosom. Why would God refuse to give a child, an innocent child according to Mormon teaching, a testimony of what truth is? According to Mormon teaching, I was innocent, blameless before God, and yet I didn't receive this burning of the bosom. And for the rest of my life, I always questioned Mormonism and its teachings. At the age of 13, my parents divorced. Um, one of the reasons why they divorced was because my father 
could not control his sexual desires and he uh, molested my sisters. This created a lot of hate and anger in me toward my father. At one point uh, I was plotting his murder but God had a different plan for that and a pl different plan for my life. My mother remarried several times and uh, I ended up joining the military to get away from my family. I wanted to get as far away from them and as far away from Mormonism as I could. It was while I was in the Marine Corps that I met my, my wife, Dana, and uh, fell in love, got married, and found out we were going to have a baby. And uh, with that came the question, what are we going to teach our child about God? And so I explained to Dana what Mormons believed, and she, once she found out that uh, Mormons believed that they could become gods, uh, she quoted to me Isaiah 43.10 and said, there's no way that we can become gods. There will be none formed before him, and there will be none formed after him. There is only one God. So we decided that uh, the best thing would be to go to a Christian church that teaches from the Bible and teaches that Jesus is the Son of God who died on the cross for my sins and who was raised from the grave. So we began looking for a church, and we found a little church on the island of Okinawa, Japan, where I was stationed in the Marine Corps called Koza Baptist Church and uh, the folks at Koza loved me and uh, welcomed me warmly and while I was there I began to hear the truth and I began to question Mormonism I began to compare its teachings with Christianity and I was amazed at how all the things that I had been taught were easily proven wrong There were a lot of things that were going on in my life personally uh, at this time. Uh, my marriage was struggling. And I needed God to fix a lot of things about my life. And I, uh, I began to seek the Lord to heal my marriage. And I, I set aside a time to pray. Every day as I drove to work, I would pray, just me and God in the front seat of my car. And as this was going on, uh, the pastor began preaching a series of sermons on the new creation that comes to those who are in Christ. And I began looking in the mirror, and I saw the same ugly person I'd always been. Nothing had changed about Brian, except that Brian had gotten better at hiding his sins. And I began to question God where is this new creation? Why hasn't it come to me? Why is there no evidence of this new creation in my life? And while I was praying this way, the Holy Spirit spoke to me and he said, Brian, what's wrong? And I said, where's this new creation? I see no evidence of it in my life. You said that those who came to Christ would become a new creation. And the Holy Spirit said, well, Brian, who, who died for your sins? And I said, well, you did, Lord. And he said, okay, well, what's missing? What haven't you done? Immediately, Romans 10, 9 through 11 came to my mind. And I replied, I've never confessed with my mouth that you are Lord. I've never asked you to come into my heart and save me to forgive me of my sin, to redeem me. I've never given my life to you. And then the Holy Spirit said, Brian, you wonder why sin still rules in your life? I can't fix what you haven't given me. I thought, well, wait a minute. You mean to say that just because I haven't said the sinner's prayer that I've been trying to get other people to say that you can't change my life, you can't save me? And the Holy Spirit said, no, Brian. I can't fix what you haven't given me. And I knew that what God wanted wasn't a sinner's prayer. He didn't want an empty confession. What God wanted was my life. He wanted all of me. Not a portion, but all of me. 
And so I pulled my car off to the side of the road and I accepted Christ as my Lord and Savior. Just me and God in the front seat of my car. And from that day on, I've been a completely different man. Praise be to God. Um, after I became a Christian, God began showing me so many things that I didn't understand in Scripture. I learned about His true nature and about the true gospel, which is a free gift from God through Christ to as many as will believe. As many as will believe in Christ and His atonement, God will redeem and usher them into His family and into His kingdom. And I want that for you too, my friend. I want you to know the God I know, to know His mercy, His forgiveness, His love, and the way that He can heal things that you think are unhealable. He's healed my marriage. He's healed my family. He's healed my heart. He's redeemed my soul. And God now uses everything that I've been through in life to His glory and His good. One of the things that God's been doing in my life after I've become a Christian is I've begun working in prison ministry. I go in and preach in the prisons. And I share what God has done with sex offenders, people who we think to be the lowest of the low. And I share with them the God who can forgive them. And God has taken all the things that I thought were ugly about me and made them beautiful as I watch prisoner after prisoner accept Christ and repent of their sin and become a new creation. And I want that for you too, my friend.